While the protests in Hamburg might have got many talking diplomacy food to Sweden, the United States, as other countries decided to go alone on the climate change issue. They say joint position on trade has been agreed with all countries pledging to resist protectionism. Let's uh, further take a look at this now as we are being joined uh, on Skype from London by the visiting professor of public policy, King's College, Andrew MacLeod. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this time. My pleasure. Right. Uh, well, give us what your thoughts are on the uh, G20 summit. It's, uh, it's been overshadowed, largely overshadowed by the protests uh, in, in Hamburg. No, I don't think so. <clears throat> I think the protests were well and truly expected. The UC protests like this at every G20 meeting. I think the story out of this G20 meeting is the complete isolation of the United States and question whether this is the G20 meeting we'll look back on in the future and say this was when the United States decline really started to accelerate and people looked elsewhere for global leadership. All right, uh, let's um, also look at... Um uh, Trump's position, yeah, as far as uh, the climate change is, uh, you know, concerned, mm. he has refused to, uh, you know, change his position, and world leaders mm. also weren't able to convince him to change his stance. No, and I think this is really important. World leaders weren't able to change Donald Trump's mind, but Donald Trump wasn't able to change world leaders' minds either. So you've got 19 going this direction and one going this direction. How can the United States claim to be leading when it's the only one going this direction? You know, all of the other major world leaders were agreed on this issue, including China, including India, including Europe. And on China, this is a really interesting thing. At the World Economic Forum earlier this year, President Xi stood up and promoted a knowledge of free trade. And at this G20 meeting, President Xi of China again reinforced that free trade is the way for economic uh, empowerment of, of for everybody and reinforce China's belief in climate change and the other 19 leaders went oh, sorry other 18 leaders went along with him and said we do agree with climate change as well and the Paris declaration is in the words of every other leader except Donald Trump irrevocable so question have we just seen the end of the United States global dominance from World War II to now and what happens next all right, uh, let's also look at um, the issue that the uh, protesting students raised, which is uh, you know, social justice and, of course, mm. solidarity with the refugees. Do you think mm. that there will ever be that social justice globally? It depends what you mean by social justice and where your, your starting point is. You and I, as two individuals, we in many ways are richer today than King Henry VIII was. We have running water in our houses, we have electricity in our houses, we have glass in our windows. And there is no doubt that the single most empowering thing that has brought more people out of poverty than anything else is well-regulated capitalism. But here's the trick. It's got to be well-regulated and it's got to take into account of everybody else. Like a lot of those protesters like to say they're the 99%. But if you have access to drinking water every day in your home, and you have access to electricity in your home, and you've done tertiary level education, if you have all those three things, you're in the top 1% globally. Viewers in Africa will understand this better than viewers in Europe and better than viewers in the United States. Africa still has a lot of areas of poverty, even in Nigeria, where people don't have tap water, don't have electricity. So if we start from that basis of what real poverty means, Many of those protesters are not the poor protesting. They are the rich protesting, but they're right in a point. We've got to make sure that well-regulated capitalism around the world spreads economic growth to the poorest and to the richest. And social justice surely means, at the very minimum, you have the ability to maximize the skills that you have as given to you at birth. And the economic and political systems must empower people to be able to use their strengths. And strangely enough, the well-regulated capitalism has been able to do that. So when you say, will we ever get social justice, behind the presumption of your question is we don't have it. Now, there are some examples in the world where social justice does not exist, like North Korea. But social justice does exist in many countries in the world in many places, but not as widespread as we would like it to be. 
Now let's also look at another scenario where Donald Trump, where the world leaders, uh, you know, gather to talk about uh, issue of uh, migration uh, to Europe, mm. you know, from Africa. And Donald mm. Trump walked out and left his daughter to take charge mm. of that meeting. What does that really say? Look, I don't, uh, I don't think it's relevant to ask how well qualified Ivanka Trump is, how smart she is, all of those sort of things. The fact is, even if she is an advisor to the president, it's not a good look to have the daughter of a president take the seat of a president. This is not a kingdom. This is not royalty in the United States. And it shows again how the United States fundamentally misunderstand how people are viewing them around the world at the moment. We used to look to the United States as a global leader. We're now all laughing. We were laughing behind our hands originally, but now it's so far out in the open that the ridiculousness of the Trump administration that we're, we are shaking our heads in bewilderment. How can a country claim to lead with one going this way and 19 going this way? It doesn't look good if a president walks out of a meeting and replaces himself with his daughter. Now, it's not unheard of in those plenary meetings for a world leader or two to go off on a side meeting and have a vice president or a senior advisor taking the seat, but not your daughter. But now let's come back to the fundamental question about migration. How do you end refugees leaving Syria? You end the Syrian war. How do you stop economic migrants leaving sub-Saharan Africa and heading towards Europe? Let's empower sub-Saharan Africa. Now, over the last 20 years, Africa has made a lot of progress. Countries like Rwanda have pulled themselves out of power, Nigeria, sorry, out of poverty. Nigeria is going very, very well. Botswana is going well. Mozambique is going well. And if we really want to help people who are looking for economic improvement, rather than improve and ease the way that they can move to Europe, let's keep focusing on getting well-regulated capitalism and good economic development in sub-Saharan Africa. Counter corruption, Africa's number one problem corruption in the political forces. And if we can counter that and continue good, broad-ranging economic growth in Africa, then people won't want to leave. And surely that's the best solution for everybody. Well, visiting Professor of Public Policy, King's College London, Andrew MacLeod, thank you very much indeed for your time. My pleasure, thank you.